Hey, hello. I'm live streaming. I'm uh, tonight doing uh, kind of a product review and a bit of an unboxing thing. I've got uh, an Everlasting Wet palette, which I bought myself. And uh, yeah, they kind of spammed me on Instagram and I saw it and I thought it would be nice to get uh, a proper Everlasting Wet palette. And it's been tested by pro painters. So I'm going to test it as a non-pro painter and see if it's any use. Um, yeah, it seems like a reasonable size thing. It's by a company called Redgrass. Never heard of them before, but yeah, they hit me with a one of their spams on Instagram. I saw it and I thought, oh, that looks really nice the way it was put together and built. But bearing in mind, my wet palette before, I normally use just a tiny bit of old plastic from a uh, model box. And I put some tracing paper over the top of some blotting paper in there. So very standard materials inside this little tray. And that normally does the trick for me for a tiny kind of miniature wet palette. But so this one's a bit bigger and uh, so I'll do an unboxing then. So I'll zoom down and I'm also going to use it. So it's not just a case of just seeing me peel packaging, which, you know, has its um, certain interest delight factors as well. But uh, let's get down and have a look. So zooming in. Ta-da. So, yeah, here it is. Everlasting Wet Palette. Let's open it up and uh, set the beast uh, running. So, I mean, what do they say about it? Save paint. So what does a wet palette do anyway? Yeah, so why not start with basics? Um, so it says it saves paint. Paint doesn't dry out during paint sessions. Now, I have my doubts about that, actually. Uh, oh, there's my face. So, yeah, I have my first off, yeah, saves paint. So what I'd say about that fact is that it says everlasting, doesn't it? But the problem with using these kind of uh, Games Workshop and Privateer Press or any other range of paints like this is that they're quite thin already. And when you put them in there with the moisture coming through, um, it results in them getting even thinner. So it doesn't last very long. I think I can get about two hours out of a piece of paint that goes in there before it gets too wet and too thinned by the moisture coming up through the uh, layers so yeah it's not necessarily everlasting I think they do last longer if you're using acrylics you know artist acrylics thick tubes by way of example I mean this this is an oil one I wouldn't use it for oils but if you had artist acrylics in these kind of tubes they'd last for ages in there I think because they wouldn't already be watered down but then you'd have to be thinning them anyway to do miniature painting so that's not exactly the right thing to do but uh, yeah, when I get open, this open, I have some 15 mil sci-fi models here, which I'm going to do some edge painting on. I'll be able to zoom into those a bit more as well. But uh, I'll stop waffling now and go on. So stop and start and we are. So they're saying, yeah, you can just unpop it and then use it. But like I said, if you've left it overnight, the likelihood is, is the paint's just going to be wet inside, too wet to use. Um, an everlasting stable hydration system. So let's have a look. Let's get it open. Yeah, so you've got the main tub itself. This is the smaller. I think they do a bigger one. I wouldn't go bigger than this. I mean, look at this. It's already filling up half the workbench. I shall slice into this. Oh, I don't need to slice. Ah. Hope you're getting all that uh, crackling. So yeah, the main box. Get of that. An elasticated garter strap to contain the two plastic sides that stretches and this which is if I can get into it I may need to cut this one this which is a little pallet thing that you can connect and I think hmm, ah there you go it does sort of fix on there oh we'll go on that side too Oh, so I was trying on the only side that didn't have magnets. So there you go. Well, that's relatively neat, isn't it? So sort it of keeps it all together. And then they've got some hydration pads. So these are it depends if you can take contrast paint. Yes, Bullens Gert. Um, thanks for pasting a comment. I wonder myself if it will. I do have some 
uh, contrast paints here so I could always uh, whack one of those in there. I've got a feeling because I've experienced obviously wet palette use for a few years now although this might be more special um, that they will just run off and they won't be great from there but yeah they've got branded pads which are meant to be anti um, anti mold and I have faced mold in a, uh, a wet palette before now um, so yeah it is a possible issue but anyway yeah, you need one of those in the bottom and they give you a spare so I guess those aren't everlasting they are consumables um, and then a pad of the um, hydration sheets themselves so assuming that it works like other wet palettes I've seen you just need one of these in there I will read the instructions, I'm not going to go in blind. So there you go, it is tracing paper and a little pad and a foamy pad. So of course you can make these yourself, like I was saying earlier. I made this stunning one here from a little piece of plastic and uh, I use that in a lot of my little videos where I don't want something big in front of me. But you know, it's nice to have the professional stuff. There you go, it's already using the moisture in the air and sort of forming up there. But uh, we'll see how that works out. So it's a pack of 50 you get in there. Good evening, everyone. Yes, thanks for joining anybody that has. Comments are welcome, of course. Especially if I can see them. They don't always come in from every one of the various channels. But if you do ask me a question, get me to do something, I will enjoy that because I feel like I'm being interactive, which is always a good thing. Let me make sure these comments are moving up. Okay. So the base pad that goes inside the wet palette, if you've just joined listeners, this is a wet palette which I've bought from a company, I still haven't got it in my head, Red Grass they're called. It's a plastic wet palette. I mean really, oh, I can't get it open. Ooh, that's, maybe that's a good sign. Oh, quite a seal on that. Yeah, so it has like a rigid kind of rubbery edge seal. So that's probably a good sign and it's been well packed in there. So that's why it kind of like sealed itself together as i mentioned earlier it's got that um oh, elasticated garter thing that goes around to keep the whole thing together so if you were traveling but if you were traveling with it the paint's just going to run up and down inside so i mean i don't know if i'm going to use that very often and of course i'm hoping now i'm going to get open again that you can sort of lay that bit inside there and you can so that goes together quite nicely Ah, but what side is up? Oh, well, I assume because it's got this interesting, there's like a, can I get that in focus? Yeah, so you can see there's like a ridge thing on the bottom. So even without reading the instructions, I'm assuming that's where this foamy pad goes. It allows the water to sort of do some magic underneath it there with the ridges before you put the tracing paper on the top and therefore leave your paint on top of that to stay moist but um, jumping back over to the instructions so that I'm saying the right thing if it has got instructions oh it just says quick setup on here why not zoom into that so we can all read it Graham not now no ah, Graham said hello just notice Graham the uh, your chat comment is very big so just doing a bit of technical wizardry while I'm talking not sure how many sandwiches fit in there yes very flat spam sandwiches and uh, you may have missed the intro earlier on they did spam me uh, with this on Instagram and I think it's probably one of the one or two things I've ever bought from a Instagram advert, but there you go. Saw it and thought I've got to have one. So yes, let's zoom in and have a read. Place one hydration pad, foam pads in the bottom of the case. So yes, it does have the grey piece as the bottom. Add water until it's saturated. Make sure the water level doesn't exceed the hydration pad. Place the hydration paper, in other words, tracing paper, on the foam. Do not wet both sides. They've missed the S. Does that mean it's made in China? I don't know. Uh, smooth out any air bubbles or wrinkles with your hand. 
the hydration paper should be smooth stick to the foam and there should be no excess water on top so of course you don't want water running over the top of it because that will start the paint running everywhere let's go then i have a measure of water here before me in a small pyrex jar and i'm going to start pouring that in so i don't think there's a right way up for the pad well i did notice earlier it had a logo i'll put the logo on the top going a bit closer All right, pouring the water in, let's see if there's some sort of magical effect. Well, of course there's not. So it's not initially very absorbent, but it's getting there. And they suggested don't have that water go any higher than the uh, hydration pad. Now, I feel like it's do not doing something it should do. We've had a Blue Peter moment here. It's not feeling like it's being very absorbent. But they missed that off the instructions, like wait five minutes. It just says add water until the hydration foam is, is fully saturated. It's it's, this hydration foam is taking its time to saturate, I can see that. Oops. So anyway, while that's soaking in, of course, I could sort of press it. I could flip it. That's the other thing, isn't it? Let's flip it. Yeah, it's really taking some time to uh, soak in. So anyway, while I talk about that, uh, while it's happening, this is my old wet palette that I was using previous to this. And all I do with this is I get some blotting paper and you can see this has been used so soaking out all sorts of strange colors um, but I put the blotting paper in first usually two sheets of it and then I would cut some of this tracing paper the same stuff they've got here just normal tracing paper from a hobby store and slice and cut it in and then I do the same as what they're suggesting here which is I let the water soak into the base and then that on top. The only thing I'm doing with this is I'm not really keeping the paint for any period of time. It's just staying wet while I work. And then I toss the little tracing paper bit when it's all used. So, yeah, I mean, that's the cheap and dirty sort of way. And it's just a piece of old um, miniature, cape, miniature packaging I'm using. And that's what I've sort of done for years. Or I did have another one somewhere, I don't know where it is. Oh, Privateer Press did them for a while, black ones. I've got one of those somewhere. But I found it a bit, a bit tricky to use. Uh, it didn't have like a well, actually they just it was just blotting paper plus tracing paper anyway so all it was was a plastic box that private press used to produce yeah i mean the first demonstration of this it's it really does take quite a long time for it to uh, absorb all the water you know it might possibly be a good thing in the sense that um that time it's taking means that it's going to hold on you know, like those plant sponge things that seem to hold on to moisture for a long time. I'm using a bit of like forceful moisture pressure. Essentially, it's really hard where it's, uh, well, it's just a general observation, but it's very hard where it hasn't absorbed the uh, sponge. It may be made of some kind of magic material. Yeah, I can just feel rock solid and then it slowly takes on the water. I mean, so that side it hasn't soaked through. That side is still working on it. Yeah, I don't want to put my tracing paper on top until I know that I've got a good old um, full surface. Although this is obviously taking long video time for <coughs> rather boring content of me uh, slowly trying to get the moisture into this. Oh, that was it, the Privateer Press one. It had a sponge in it. Like the kind of sponge you get in miniature packing um, storage cases. That sort of grey sponge was in the bottom and it did dry out quickly. This one looks like it's a bit more technical. Put a little bit more in there.
Yeah, super absorbent. That's the only thing I'd have said to them really on their instructions would have been um, a suggestion that someone waits a little bit longer to uh, to get that in. I thought this would be instant, sort of pour it in and it would go straight into the sponge, but uh, that's it, it's done. Oh, there are some areas where it's kind of overhanging, but I reckon it's still taking it in. Hmm. It's still taking it in, but let's let's get rid of the excess anyway. Right, we're nearly ready for actual action. Right now, I know this is going to be hassle. This is the other thing with uh, wet palettes. When you put this in, it has a tendency to sort of. I don't know if you've ever had one of those Christmas crackers that. Uh, I'm assuming deionized or similar water to prevent it going stale and stinky. No, well, I'll just use chlorinated water, but um, there's a promise on the case that says it won't go moldy. There's anti-mold agents or something inside this pad. So, well, that's not too bad. It does say push it down and you, you want it completely flat. And of course, the, the problem with the flat situation is that it is tracing paper. It's going to... Uh, want to wrinkle up. I don't know how you'd avoid these wrinkles if you can see them. You certainly don't want to iron them in there. But um, you know, how long do you want to spend doing this, getting these wrinkles out? When I've used a wet palette before, when I've put paint in, often the wrinkles are, are sometimes a handy barrier between different paints if you are sort of working. But that's... Um, quite wrinkly. I wonder if I lift up. Oh, got the biggest wrinkle ever now. Mm. Oh, this is good. Oh, well, there's a tip for you straight away. When you put it down and it goes wrinkly, Lift it up and go down a second time because despite my complete failure with a massive wrinkle, I've had a much better result all around. And I haven't gone on very neatly there, I've left a border for this side, it's down neatly. There it is a mostly de wrinkled wet palette. I can feel the moisture coming through. And uh, no, I don't have any deionized water, but maybe I should get some ground for the future to avoid any mold in there. So that's it, a wet palette working. And um, I've got some miniatures here and I did mean to go back and do some of their visors again, some 15 mil ground zero games. I've got some very old uh, games workshop models. This is the, the mouth of Sauron. I've put some nameplates on there from uh, a guy called Versatile Terrain who does uh, these nameplates that go on the edges of bases. Um, and then you can basically paint them. So if you use them in games and things, you can see their name. This one I haven't finished. This is a character in a role-playing game called Wilbo. Um, a friend of mine is playing that one. And uh, Halfling Barbarian. But I haven't actually finished doing the base for him there. But these, these bases sit on the side of the 33 mil. Uh, they were 30 mil bases and they sort of sit slightly proud. Anyway, let's try the actual paint on here and see the other functions. So the other thing is this miniature tray that it comes with. And, ah. So actually I think the right way to do this is get rid of this piece unless you're sealing it up because obviously this neat little, um, this neat little attachment tray it fits on this bottom section, so that's where you want it to sit. So you don't need all the rest of that orange gear out on here while you're using it. So it's quite large, and normally, if I zoom out, so over here is where I'd normally put my, and I've got space for it to slot in there, but I'm going to leave it in front of me because then you can see some of the different paints going on and what happens to them. So shaking up some here. Hmm. Well, I've got two blues to improve the visors, like I was going to do a quick pass on these visors on these 15mm guys. And uh, 
I'll blend those together. And also I can use some of this glaze medium from Vallejo, which I tend to use a lot for any mixing of paints. Oh, and also the rattling you can hear in there, that's, um, that's some of these steel ball bearings that I put in the bottom of there for a good shake. Magnets at Graham are on three sides. Um, interestingly enough, there's no magnets on this side, but you've got them on the front and on that side. So I could sort of flip it around that side and they sell these extra. So you can buy, I did actually get a second one of these. So you can see one on the side. I thought I was going to put an order in. I may as well get a couple of those. I mean, it's, it's not a massively solid fit, but it, it's decent enough. Right, so take that off there again, put that around there, stick that down. Oh yeah, I was just saying that all my, my paints, I tend to put these steel balls in the bottom just to help agitate the paint. Also, these paints I've had for ages, so they, uh, they've thickened up over the time. So to decant them out there, I sometimes use, if I've got a thin paint, I use a pipette, but I'm not going to do that because this paint's quite thick and I've got some really old, you know, scummy old brushes to decant the paint out onto the surface. So here we go. Some blue, probably way too much. That's um, Signal Blue Highlights, a private press color. And then I'm gonna put some Arcane Blue beside it. Yeah, brush holder and small water trough for miniature, miniature piglets. Um, that come up and want to use that gram. Definitely, definitely see that happening. I've just realized I need a tissue uh, to uh, dry the brush on. Well, this is something, because I do these videos here, I often get stuff all over the place in the way and uh, magnets help. So I've got a steel sheet, just so you know, underneath here. So magnets and things like this Cthulhu magnet, just go sit down on there and that stops that from moving around when I'm using it, just so you know why they're there. Uh, not just some random decoration, although there's lots of random decoration. So let's get some of the arcane blue out and put it aside. This really is an old stinky brush. And then just for so that I can blend them together, I was going to use some of the glaze medium. I'm wondering with this whether I should pour it into one of these because before now what happens with this glazed medium it's great for like mixing without thinning by that I mean if you just put water on there and then started to mix them together they go kind of really thin but if you use a glazed medium you get slightly thinner paint but it doesn't go all watery um, and it's a bit more of a glaze but I'm not talking about glazes right now I'm going to put it in the little tray because, as I say, what I've done with this before is it's very thin and watery. I've popped it in there. Obviously, it's not going to keep it from going dry in there, but it will mean it doesn't sort of run all over the place, which glaze medium has a tendency to do. You know, you put a couple of small drops on and they start to smear into everything else, which can be okay. So, right, brushes then and zoom in so you can see what's happening down there to these tiny splats of uh, paint. Hey. So that's pretty much in, in focus. Oh, we've got little trucks in the way. These are magnets as well for holding on to things. Right. So the idea is that by the uh, power of, was it osmosis? What's the word that you use to describe water evaporating up through something? Graham will set me straight on that. But basically, it'll, the moisture draws up through the tracing paper and is constantly providing um, a source of moisture up into the paint. So by that very nature, eventually, there's going to be too much moisture drawn up through and they'll go thinner and thinner and thinner. But uh, for a good maybe half hour or so, you've got wet paint out that's not going to um, dry up on you. If you're doing a whole load of stuff, like, for example, if I'm doing this army sort of... Uh, these Ground Zero Games models. What are those? The new Swabian League, I think. Yeah, NSLs. So yeah, so if I was doing a whole army of these and I want to do a whole load of sections of the armour at once, uh, the paint will just stay moist there.
but obviously as I said before, capillary. And no, I don't think it's capillary, it's osmosis or something. Someone's going to know that. Osmosis, I'm looking, I'm going on the internet. Hmm. Yeah, osmosis is the process by which molecules of a solvent tend to pass through a semi-permeable membrane from a less concentrated solution into a more concentrated one. So yeah, I think just basically that what it means is that moisture comes up through the tracing paper from the from the sponge underneath and uh, deals with it in terms of keeping it moist. So back to the video and what I'm doing. And let's get some brushes out. It's a decent brush. I ordered a new brush in the day. You know when you're doing this and you think, why not get that new brush out to use it? And then you think, hmm, where's the new brush gone? I don't know. So I'm going to use an old brush. The brush I'm going to use. Is this the new AP wet palette Tauros? Um, AP, let me check. No, it's red grass. Um, red grass wet palette. And you can see the whole thing there. Kind of comes with this elasticated waistline. And uh, there's two clamshell parts that go together with magnetic areas around the edge, which you can connect these uh, little things on. I say Taurus, so I got this um, on. Um, Instagram I saw it they sort of spammed me on Instagram obviously they were looking for miniature painters on there and uh, and I saw it and I thought oh I needed a new wet palette I'll try it out so I bought them I bought one they do a larger one uh, I can't see why I'd ever need a larger one unless I was painting a house or something cause it's, it's massive um, particularly for some of these 15 mil models that I'm doing because they aren't uh, very big so yeah I've got some I've got a Tamiya modeling brush pro size zero zero and these are sable and oh the new AP one is all over the internet today. Ah who's AP anyway? Just so I know Taurus. Hey, Army Painter Army Painter got there before you even had to say <laughs> slow brain. Yeah, I guess everybody's starting to you know do these sort of things, aren't they? Privacy Press used to have one, which I had. Um, I had a Windsor and Newton one from a hobby shop as well. Right, let's get in there then. So I'm using a bit of the um, glaze medium, mixing it in. Oh, that's quite nice. With the blue, just to thin the blue down a little bit. I say, I mean, it feels nice. I don't know. You're not, probably not getting that through the camera. And um, probably need to zoom into these now so I can see what the hell I'm doing. I don't know how much brighter this colour is actually. Let's try it. No, it's not much different than what's already on there. So I'll need to blend it in with the... Uh, it's probably the colour that was used in the first place and done quickly. So I will mix together on there some of that brighter arcane blue and I'm going to go along the bottom, highlight down to the bottom. Don't focus anymore. Yeah, when you're doing visors and things, the, the plan is that you, you highlight towards the bottom and go dark towards the top. Don't know how accurate that is in terms of lighting, but yeah, so I thought I'd do some actual painting with the wet palette open, as in it will provide me a kind of amount of feedback. I say on the box it said tested by pro painters and I'm not a pro so I'm testing by a normal painter now I'll let you know how I'm getting on. Oh 
I was saying what I'm going to do as well is just decant some white, just some of this Moro white, they call it, from Privateer Press. And I know, um, oh, the figures are Ground Zero games. They're um, 15 mil sci-fi models by Ground Zero games. Um, yeah, I've got a whole load of them, a drawer of them. I'll get them out. I'll show them off, shall I? They're in need of their bases being finished with some uh, tufts of graphs and things. Um, but they are 15mm um, sci-fi models based them on group bases like this. And these ones are from a, a range from Ground Zero Games, which is gzg.com. Uh, gzg.com. And in the NSL, these are called, or New Swabian League. I think that a New Swabian League is basically future Germans, is the, the generally the, uh, uh, their faction um, from Ground Zero Games. Oh, I've got a bit of junk in there. Yeah, I've got a variety of different models. I've got like um, gun teams. I've got guys with uh, specialists with the rocket launchers. Uh, various different gun teams, so sort of like a single shot long long range thing. Um, some sort of auto cannon AC, and then a variety of other units in there. And this one here, who interestingly looks like Baron Harkonnen in a suit. So he's my commander on a two pence piece. And then these are the squads. The squads are in uh, squad sizes of four, eight or twelve. Uh, a squad of twelve would just be three bases together. Yeah, so that's the new Swabian League. And I've got a lot there to get through, but I thought I'd just do some improvements on the visors because they've had a, a really good sound base paint job all the way through them. But uh, didn't sort of finish it with any extra detail. Right, back to that wet palette. Yeah, all the GZG 6mm are fantastic as well. Um, although I think he's sort of, he does less of the 6mm. I think, I think he did some more recently again. But So... So the intention when you're doing visors is to highlight up to the bottom with the brightest colour and, and go dark towards the top. So I'm going to give you that sort of impression of the light reflect, reflected upside down. Oh, thanks, Elf Bait. Yeah, I think sci-fi humans-wise, they've got just about everything. And then along the top, you do the darker colour, switching back to my thinking, and then I realise I haven't got a darker colour on me. It gets out my Exile Blue by Privateer Press. Here's a little uh, train spotter like comment about Privateer Press paints, in the fact that they're kind of, in a weird way, British, even though they're made by Privateer Press, the creators of War Machine, etc., War Hordes. Um, Mike McVeigh, who used to be um, a senior person at Games Workshop, left Games Workshop, I don't know the dates or years, but he went to Privateer Press to be like a, I don't know, a chief art design or painter or something. But while he was there, he created these, um, he created these, this range of paint and used really fine pigments Oh, that's too much wet. Use very fine pigments in the process. Uh, as a result, they are very good for blending and mixing. I mean, I know there's millions of other possible paints out there. But, uh, I like the story that Mike left Games Workshop and went to Private Press and then created a sort of set of paints that he thought were, to him at least, I guess they were, he was aiming for something better than what he used to use at Games Workshop. 
although I use all the Games Workshop paints and don't have a particular loyalty, but I do like the Privative Press ones. So yeah, what I've done there essentially, in a, in a kind of ragtag quick way, is I've put the glow on the visors towards the bottom. And then what you should do, um, well, you don't have to do it this way, but this is how I've always done it, is then you put a tiny white dot somewhere along the top. At least that's the sort of quick and dirty way to give a kind of an impression of a visor. And you can take a lot more time with that. But if you're, uh, you know, blending and what have you, but just as a general, let's get it like tabletop height. Trying to make them look better by zooming in them for a long way away. Obviously in Warfare, you don't want glare, do you? But anyway, it looks kind of eye candy-ish, doesn't it, when you do it? Which is what I like. And uh, this base needs some tufts of grass and things as well, but I will be doing that later on. Oh yeah, that's a good tip, Graham. And that's what airbrushes do as well, isn't it? They um, You always start with um, your lighter colours as the base when you're airbrushing. And then from there you go up towards your... Um, go up towards darker because it's easier to cover the light with the dark colour. So I just happen to have this guy here with one of those bases. Um, so he's a... Mouth of Sorum, an old Games Workshop model that I've had for, I'd say, 30 years, 30, 28 years maybe, in my collection. And i just recently given him one of these um, bases from, I can't remember, but I said it earlier on. So if you're watching earlier, you'll remember who it's from. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's it, Versatile Terrain. He 3D prints the name bases, so you get to pick. And... Um, Let's just, I'll just keep using the paint on the wet palette. It's actually gone, some of it's gone quite naturally thinned by the water. So, since I just want to get this blue on here. Just drawing the, uh, drawing the brush over rather than sort of painting. You know, it's like a wet dry brush on the nameplate. I've spoken to the chap at Versatile Terrain who makes these um, because he, I, of course you've given them the names you want so this is the name I've asked for and I've called it Resurrectionist Hornack or Mornack, yeah, with an M and um, I had all sorts of other ideas because of course you give him the name and he prints it and I thought maybe I could put for the Grunts 15 mil game I could do bases or do a kind of a marker that sits on the base with the stats on it or something like that, which would be interesting, although it kind of locks the model to a set of stats, doesn't it? Let's get that more into focus. Yeah, so I'll highlight this up a bit um, on the basis that I'm going to use some of those. I'm going to put on here in a moment the Games Workshop contrast paint and then just see where I go from there. Some overspill. Oh, you're looking a little bit more interesting. I tell you what, it's really not hard to um, it's really not hard to highlight text and make text look good. I don't know if anybody's an Amiga or an Atari ST computer owner from back in the day, but um, 
Why am I linking to this? I'm linking to this because back in the day on those uh, machines, if you were ever involved in um, the gaming sort of scene and sharing games and going around each other's houses, they'd quite often see um, people do demos, intro demos with music blaring out on the Amiga and there'd always inevitably be some text and they'd always use some sort of, you know, that steel effect where you'd have a set of text and the, the uh, computer would then give you a kind of gradient between a, a light to dark and it's quite an effective way of um, quickly doing text. I say it's only taken what, like five minutes or something. And I've got quite a nice effect on that uh, on that base. Robin, what is your take on this trend? What was the trend? I missed that comment. Oh, it's gone off the top of the screen. I'll tell you what I can do, I think. I can rescue that. I can drag the text down. Oh no, I can't. So whoever mentioned that first day and said, what is your take on this trend? Give me a shout again, because I missed that comment, sorry. But Graham then said, yep, also try to line a dark pigment and say white. You'll use a huge amount of white to get the shade you need. Yeah, dark pocket into light reaches the same shade quicker. That's true. So yeah, back to the paint job. And back to the paint wet palette. Is it, how's it working for me? Well, so far it's, this blue, which I've drawn out over the, the palette, has uh, very much gone wet, uh, sort of thinned down. I did use some of the um, pool of, um, move it over a bit, but I had the little pool there of the glaze medium, which is very thin, which I did put a drop or two on there. When you break the paint out, basically from that, from its original blob that you put on, it does draw the moisture through much more quickly. So I'm going to end up with a very thin areas of paint. And I know what happens to this later because I've used a wet palette before. Slowly, all of the paints will sort of start to gain more moisture through the pad and, um, and blend together. But uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting stuff. See, this blue's got a lot of black in it there. So in a way, you were able to thin the paint just by drawing it out of the original blob you put on and, um, and then using it from there. So I'm just doing a black, darker blue right along the top of this text. Not black, but sort of dark bluey black. And then if I use the same principle on the whole visor thing that I did before, if I get some of the white, I can, um, I can I'm seeing this almost as blurry as you are because I'm half blind as it is. I can then dot some white along the top text areas, which will define that top of the text quite neatly, I think, in terms of making it possibly legible. Oh, that was too big a blob. I found the other day, I've got a few of these models where I do these um, nameplates for games and uh, I think I nearly spent longer on the nameplate than I did on the miniature. But... The Resurrector Mornak. That's what I've called him. I haven't used him in a role-playing game yet. But let's um, let's do something interesting with that. Let's continue the blue around the edge, and then I'm going to use some of the um, Citadel contrast paints on there a bit. 
So it's got quite thin paint now, which is good in a way, because I want it to go on quick. And thin. You know, if I was doing this properly, I should really do the background first. And also, I don't really mind too much if I get it around the edge. Because um, I can tidy it up later. It has really thinned the paint down that's been left on there, which is again not necessarily a bad thing depending on what you're painting. Ah, uh, Christopher M. Yes. Well, I've had a debate. I've got a, a closed uh, playtest group and. Um, the new Grunts version 2 is in playtest and I'm group basing because I wanted a sort of larger, easier to move around model set and obviously that doesn't please all gamers because some people want, the, want to sort of downsize their skirmish for 15mm and have individual bases. Um, however, all the playtests I've been doing so far are with a combination of group bases versus um, single bases on the on the basis that um, I want to be able to make sure I can support single basing. Uh, that said, I think generally speaking, the new rules are faster and more designed generally around a group base. So uh, that's probably where it's going. And someone recently said. Why don't you rename Grunts 2 to be more representative of this of that kind of scaling out to sort of squad or company size? So I had that in mind. I'm in half a mind to call the new Grunts 15mm sci-fi um, Grunts 15mm company as a sort of subtitle, really. But in principle, all the rules like you have the soak and a guard and all the usual things are all still there so it's pretty much the same thing and I've got some excellent uh, artwork coming in which has uh, been a sort of focus over the last six or seven weeks or so so I could blend a few other darker bits through there possibly just to sort of make it look interesting not really focusing on what i'm doing but just sort of going for it in the background yes yeah, i say i've had some artwork done for grunts i've got uh, some really nice mecha artwork done by someone I, who's in the battletech world arena um, does artwork for battletech I've had six or so nice models made there. Um, well, not models at the moment. When I say models, there are their drawings. And also from um, from an artist in Thailand, I've had some really good different um, soldier kind of models and vehicles and things coming from that direction too to sort of improve the new rules. I didn't want to go out with new rules and just reuse all the same uh, models and bits and pieces that I had before. So what I'm doing on here is just trying to blend in various different colours to make it look I don't know, marbled or something, magical marbled. Lightning perhaps. And um, and then I'll go on with some one of the Games Workshop colours, just to sort of the contrast colours.
to sort of darken it all down. And this is where I'm going to try those uh, contrast colours on the palette. And I really think they're going to run all over the place, but let's see. Uh, let's see on the edge there. So anybody just to remind them that uh, Speedball 2 had that sort of text, I think. Yes, that's all right. Yeah, Taurus, thanks. Yeah. Speed of play or other issue uh, pushing the change. It's kind of speed of play and visual and also design in terms of how I see the units working and potentially making the game a bit faster you know in terms of uh, when you're playing grunts and you're you're slowly grinding through one shot at a time from the a skirmish group and that's fine in grunts v1 if you've had maybe a game where you pay four squads on the table but if you then said to someone oh i'm you know they want to go big and they want 20 squads on the table it's going to be too much of a grind going through one model at a time so that's one of the reasons but here's the everlasting palette that's what i'm review kind of reviewing and using and there's the whole extent of it if you've joined late you haven't been able to see the earlier piece i unboxed this so they sold it to me on instagram i was fooled i was grabbed spammed and i went okay i'll have a look at that and i ordered one and it has a foamy base underneath and the typical wet palette tracing paper on the top um, but it seems to be working really well i can feel the moisture coming up through into my fingers through the tracing paper and it's keeping the paint wet and I've been going maybe about an hour or so. So yeah. Right, let's use some contrast paints, blue ones I think, to uh I've got two bluish ones. Talisar and Etheromatic Blue. Back in my day they used to name paints with names that you could actually understand, you know, skull white, and chaos black. I mean, they could have shortened that. They called it ether blue or something, and talis blue. They just add, I don't know, it's all an IP thing, isn't it? They don't want anybody to ever copy it, so they kind of make up a name that's never, ever existed before. So I think they got into problems, didn't they, with Imperial Guard and things like that, because actually there was an Imperial Guard in the Napoleonic's Wars and things, so basically um, they couldn't claim ownership. So they make up all their names wacky now because they don't want them to exist in real life. It reminds me of an episode of Futurama, another nerd, nerdy um, train spotterish comment is in the TV series Futurama. In terms of naming things, they wanted to name some of those kind of like alien popcorns, which turned out to be alien babies, but they thought they were like a really tasty popcorn. They were like eating them, and um, they'd run out of names literally every single possible combination of letters had been had ip taken so uh you know every name in the universe or possible combination of characters and they ended up with popsicles so a bit like testicles and um anyway that was a funny moment in future armor if you're a fan so how's this going to go and i'm going to have to decant it with a pipette because it's too thin but you could put it uh, i've got this filthy old brush for transferring paint onto the palette but that would just go all over the shop. So I think it's thin enough to... Oh, and that's the other thing worth mentioning contrast paints. Let's show you the bottom of one. I think it's that one. Maybe it's one of the darker ones. There you go. So this is a greyish colour. And you can see the pigment... Uh, the pigment is separated from whatever the acrylic agent is or something in there. So you do have to really shape these. So interestingly enough, even though they're really thin paints, they separate quick. And when I bought mine in Brighton in the UK, uh, in a shop in, in Brighton, the they came like this. It was almost like they'd been on a shelf somewhere waiting and all the pigment and had separated from the agent in there. So yeah, you do need to give them a good shake. Right, I'll use this light one first. Right, I'm going to do it. Okay, here we go. Pigment into the pipette. This is my scientific... Oops, dropped it on there. Get rid of the spare. Don't want to put too much on. That's it. These pipettes, by the way, are really handy. If, I know it's probably killing the world. Plastic. I mean, and the worst kind of plastic, isn't it? I can't wait that they, they use those plastic beads to create it and it just all gets washed into the sewer and into the food chain. But they're handy and they're only two pence each on eBay. Don't 
don't uh, let anybody oh look so here we go let's zoom in it's all the same brand on it's a gumpler channel oh. right so it's I can see it spreading out as it sits there but um, yeah that is a contrast paint on there and it's very thin and when you draw into it it tends to want to spread so I probably put too much on definitely for the fact that I was just going to smear some on this base but it, it's looking good oh and that's the other thing with contrast paints they do respond well to being mixed with things like these uh, glaze mediums uh, from Vallejo I've done that a few times so yeah, that looks like it would stay alive on there, that contrast paint. Um, let's see, let's stick some on this model somewhere just to randomly do it. Some of that sort of random stuff I put there to sort of give it a glaze. Well, see, the thing with this contrast paint, it does take a long time to dry. The other thing I've seen contrast paint do when I've used it, I used it on a, a Dungeons and Dragons model, one of these ones that comes pre pre primed, and um, once it had dried, before I'd varnished with any kind of dull coat, it started to crack off. The model obviously was a plastic, one of those kind of plasticky, rubbery models, and it, it cracked off. Just in a small area, and I thought that's interesting. Like the the you because I tried to do a paint job just using contrast paints on it, and it dries so thin that it it has a tendency to crack. So yeah, I mean that's just gone on out. Take ages to dry, but it will give it a uh, slightly uh, a glazed look over the colours to sort of bring them together. Especially the whites will look a little bit bluer if I go over those on the top. Let's go back to the 15mm sci-fi guys that I put the from Ground Zero Games. I put that. Uh, let's put use some of the contrast paint on those visors. This is going to go everywhere if I put too much on. Difficult to tell the difference really, but that does have a slight glaze on it. I've realised what I need to do on this space now is really darken that down that blue. So I'm tempted to blast it with my hairdryer to get it dry. But back to the uh, palette. It's holding out okay with the contrast paint, which is really thin. Um, obviously, I put a, quite, I've put too much on there really for what I was after, but you can see it's um, it's hold it holds on there well. So if you're using some of those bendy plastic mods, I do have issues of paint adhering. Yeah, definitely. And also the problem with those um, many of those models from is it whiz kids that do them i don't know who the manufacturer is but they come pre-primed but they still have their mold lines and things on them i was going to find some examples actually because i was uh, doing these up i sprayed these up the other day um, so these are uh, an example of good WizKids kind of 
D and D models in that they are these fire elementals, but they they come clear, and the primer on them is probably just a um, spray from like a dull coat or something, like a matte varnish, because it doesn't they don't want to cover up the clear material underneath, and then I just airbrushed it red and orange, and then did some paint with some black stuff on them as well. So those were good. Those didn't present me any problems in terms of um, issues with mold lines or cracking or anything. They work quite well. I'm trying to find an example of one that didn't work as well. I had mold lines on, but now I haven't got one to hand. Yeah, so I'm quite pleased with the uh, wet palette, I think. I can see that it's done well holding on to the, you know, where I haven't started to smear it all over the place. It's, it's held on well to the uh, privateer press paints. And um, handy to have the little tray beside. I mean, you could put water in there or some other kind of thinner for speed. Here you can see just because I put the white and that blue, I connected them. Just a bit of wet palette practice to do there is to try unless you really are mixing the two colors you will start to see things blend they draw into each other when you put them next to each other and as I say sometimes that's a desired result but probably better use of the pad would be to put your dots of color separate and then grab a piece and then grab another and then blend separately so they're not kind of constantly falling into each other like these ones here are doing but still handy for blending and for me, I would just recover. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. The fact I've got a bit of blue in my white, I can just quickly use the, you know, dip into there. It's not a major issue really. Yeah, that's it then. So what I can't do on the video, obviously, is uh, show you what would happen if I left this um, in there for another. Um, day or something but I might uh, I probably will see I'll seal it up with the lid this orange lid and um, I'll use that strap as well like I've wasted that paint in there I have to clean that out and uh, this will obviously seal it together and I will comment on the video on Facebook etc oops this is going to be a nightmare getting that on without causing all sorts of grief there you go so yeah, I will, I'll leave it flat, obviously. You don't want to put it upside down because that paint will just run all over the place. And I'll open it up tomorrow and see if it is everlasting because they say it's an everlasting palette. Um, but the question for me will be, is it going to be one big sort of smear of paint in there tomorrow? And I think it will be. I think I said earlier, if you're using, you know, tubes of acrylic type paint that are really thick, that will hold its shape in there and stay there. But if you're using these kind of wet paints from miniature hobby games I think it's going to just go all wet inside it's going to keep drawing and drawing through the moisture unless by sealing it like it's done here it stops that happening it might do so I'm going to open that up tomorrow get it out of the way find out whether that's uh, done anything so go back to me there right Yeah, lots of fans of the old Epic game. I noticed recently Games Workshop have produced another one of those box games for um, that flying aircraft game. Actually, I've got one of them somewhere. Let me have a look. Wanders over to the cupboard and back again. Oh, yeah, I have uh, these orc flyers from i think they were from uh well obviously they're kind of six mil ish scale uh, from the whole um epic sort of scene when they did flyers like this and um yeah they're quite nice detail on them incredible detail let's zoom into it because it's no good me just sort of looking there yes yeah, so i've had them for years and i, I prime them and I never did anything with them, but they're kind of orc bombers, aren't they? Look, it snapped off its little uh, dual barrel thing there. I think they both suffered that. You know when you've had something in your collection, you've never done anything with it. I do have them. 
I do, you know, I do have those little bits in my little tray of broken off bits somewhere. And this one even has a small orc in the back and he's kicking the, the bombs out of the door. That's a bit of detail for you. Um, and they did sort of bigger, they've got kind of Imperial Guard bombers as well. I don't know where they are, but they look a bit like Lancaster bombers. And I say they've just re-released this game, and it's, but it's just all fighters versus fighters. I prefer a kind of mixed game where you might be using them for bombing runs and things in epic type games. Yeah, but yeah, I don't know if anybody knows about that. I don't even know what it's called, but I just saw it on Instagram that someone was posting up the pictures of it that they were they were painting. And it just looks like Orc Fighters versus Imperial Guard Fighters, although they've all got different names now. And uh, one day I might use these in a 6mm game if I ever get around to airbrushing them. Now they've been primered and glued together and cleaned up a bit. Yeah, this was an accident. I was never meant to have two. Just another quick comment. I think I asked for two different ones and my wife uh, bought me the same one twice, which of course I forgave her for instantly. It was nice to have two of the same model. And then I've spent, I mean, they've been in a drawer for 15 years. The shame, ah, oh, the shame. All right, so switching back and I'll just say goodbye because I think I've done a general overview of that wet palette. I like it. I'm going to introduce it into my workflow. It's going to sit here on the side of the tray at all times. And, um, you know, the paint's drying off on these slowly down here on these pieces of work that I've been doing. But thanks very much. So I'll go back to me. That's it. Go pro. Great. Thanks. So thanks very much for listening in. And, um, you know, if you do have the opportunity to go over to YouTube or Twitch, I've streamed to there and appreciate a follow or an ad or whatever it happens to be alike. Um, because I do various videos like this and uh, appreciate the, um, the input and uh, the views. Okay. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Stop streaming.